humour is as much part of who we are as uh, as breathing and walking and seeing and being in the joke. It's it's the fizz in our lives. Welcome to the Humorology Podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humour with you. Humorology is the study of how humour can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this edition of the Humorology podcast is a multi-award winning actor who is also the portrait of a popular history presenter. His legendary career spans from the theatre to the silver screen and everything in between. He was a successful child actor who has never stopped working from playing the fool in King Lear to the title role in The Hypochondriac. Along the way, he wrote and starred in the seminal kids' comedy Maid Marian and Her Merry Men, for which he won a BAFTA. He spent decades as the host of the historic Channel 4 behemoth Time Team, where he solidified himself as an impeccable icon who imparted immersive information to the masses. As a member of the Labour Party, he has contributed to a variety of quality campaigns aimed at the progression of human and labour rights. His political and presenting performances propelled him to prominence when he was knighted by the Queen in 2013. From his legendary charity work to his beloved role as Baldrick in Blackadder, He has quickly become the nation's premier presenter of popular history and political prowess. So, Tony Robinson, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Thank you. Gosh, I've really been going a long time, haven't I? You just kept going and going and and all these various years rolled past me like those when those calendars used to flip by in a movie, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, there was so much to get in and I thought of cutting things out and I thought, no, the, the public need to know all the things you've done, Tony. It was just a remarkable career. But I want to go back. Um, I mentioned you were a child actor and we'll come back to yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the Jesuits say, give me a child of seven and I will give you the man. Was the young Tony Robinson funny? I think probably the young Tony Robinson was far funnier than I am now. I was thinking about this earlier, actually, because I, you sent me some notes, and one of the notes was, what is your favourite joke? And I was thinking, people, by and large, don't tell jokes now in the same way that they used to. It's like people at family gatherings tend not to go over to the piano and start playing, and then everyone joins in. I did, you know, cultures do change, and that idea of a, a joke as something that we trade among ourselves which used to be so important to me when I was a kid it's like you it had to be the best joke and you 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 had to say it the best and your mum and dad would tell you jokes that they probably learned about 40 or 50 years ago sort of, it's sort of completely disappeared but yes I think in those days a I told lots of jokes and b I wanted to be funny it seemed I don't know it was a bit like impressing people I think really so was humour valued in your family then? Yeah, very much so, yeah. I think probably because both my parents, and this will come as a shock to you, both my parents w- w- were little. And I think my... when you're little, you uh, you need some kind of safety jacket, some, something to get you through. And comedy is a, a, a wonderful way of doing that. W- with Rowan, it was his, his big ears and his stutter. With me, it was my height. And... Uh, I gave you a security, I think. Yeah, that's very interesting because, but also your your parents were in show business on one level or another. I mean, I think your father played in a dance band for the Canadian Forces, didn't he? And your mum loved amateur dramatics. Do you yeah, think it was something genetic? 
it wasn't so much that they were in showbiz, which makes it sound like, you know, they were in a Judy Garland movie, which I was later on, interesting. Anyway, um, they, um, uh, my dad worked for what was then called the LCC that became the GLC, you know, the, the organisation that ran London. He was a clerk and then worked his way up. My mum was an audio typist, but as you say, she loved amateur dramatics and she picked that up during the war. Um, and my dad... Uh, when he was in the RAF in, in the war, the, the load of Canadian forces in East Scotland where he was, and they needed a, a pianist in their dance band. And he said, I'll do that. He could just about find his way through, around a piano, but he wasn't in any sense a pianist. And he learned on the job. He learned going around to all those village halls and community centres night after night and had a fantastic war as a pianist, and he could have gone back to Canada and been a professional musician, but he decided not to because my mum and dad were both working class hackney kids and my dad, because he'd been reasonably successful in his career, was able had been able to buy a semi-detached house in South Woodford in 1938. And that was their dream, and that had been their dream before the war, and that's what they wanted to go back to. So in a way, I think, uh, what I do and what I am is an echo of all those yearnings that they had, but which were never fulfilled. Well, that, well, they must have been so proud because I, I think at 14, you were in the uh, stage production of Oliver with, I mean, some absolute legends. And it wasn't Ron Moody was in it, Georgia Brown. Was it Phil Collins there at the same time? as no, you? Uh, no, Phil, uh, Phil wasn't. But my understudy was Steve Marriott, who went on to be the lead singer of oh. The Small Faces. So, uh, and that was funny, a lot of those boys were musicians uh, and went on to become musicians, as it were, rather than going down the other route as, as actors. I was actually in the original cast of Oliver, so I was there oh. on, the, on the first night. Um, and I think we had something like 27 curtain calls. But like as a kid, how do you know that's a big deal? You've never done that before. Maybe that's what happens to, to to everybody. So yeah, yeah, I was, uh, I can't know what your question was, but I was in the original cast. <laughs> well, no, actually I wanted to let them, it was about their pride of, of oh, yeah. oh, that's fulfilling right. their, their, their dreams. I often ask myself about that. Objectively, it is quite clear to me that if I say they pushed me, that sounds as though they, they were getting, getting some resistance but they certainly went on this road with me to being a child actor, which was odd really, because I was like in the A stream at my local grammar school. Um, and my teachers were intent on me having an academic career, which I didn't want in the slightest. I was so lazy. Anybody listening to this will think, well, yeah, I was lazy too. No, you weren't lazy like I was lazy because I was supposed to be in shows an awful lot of the time. Nobody knew whether I was supposed to be at school or not. I used to bunk off for weeks at a time. And I, I say I used to bunk off, I used to bunk off. And then I would go in at lunch and have lunch and, and a game of football. Uh, and then I would leave again. <laughs> It was at school, wasn't it, where where you first went on stage? And I heard that, that when you got your first laugh from an audience in the school play, uh, you described it as wine to your soul. Um, Billy Crystal um, said about Robin Williams is uh, he needed those extra little hugs that you can only get from a stranger. Was that? Is that a lovely phrase? As we get older, we have to realise what we are, don't we? Because uh, and we do need that, 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 that. And the laugh does that. I think one of the problems for young performers, it's probably true of performers generally, is that you have this kind of uber life, which is on the stage waiting for the show that night. I was uh, had a chat with, with Matt Lucas the other day and we both agreed that if somebody says to you, will you be in a show? It's all right, you'll only be on for about 10 minutes, so you'll be in and out, you know, it, it would just be great fun. The fact is, when you're in a show, it dominates the whole of your day from the moment you wake up to the moment that you go to bed. You are in some way in that world. And I think it's, what it means for a young child is that you don't develop another world. So 
show business it is your world it's more than just your blanket it's your blanket your duvet your bed your bedroom it's everything and i think that's why performers tend to get so terrified when they're out of work because it's like there's no me for me to be if i'm not working i think that's the that's the great fear the great terror so i mean you live to work essentially do you or or they they become the same thing I think as I've got older, I've, be, I've been able to develop some ob objectivity about it. I think the first time you lose one of your kids in, in, in a department store. <laughs> oh, don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, suddenly actually being in a show has far less importance than it did have. The first time a friend of yours or a relative of yours gets cancer. First time, you know, you see that you know that you only have that limited amount of time with them. Those kinds of things, I think, I think uh, hopefully for most of us, we're able to, 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 to shift that performance part of us up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit more. But lockdown was actually great for me. I had always been so consumed by my work, not necessarily comedy. It didn't have to be comedy work after a time. It could be writing, it could be directing, it could be anything. Um, Suddenly, because I was, wasn't really doing that for months at a time, I had to develop my own resources again. And I think a really charming thing happened to me. We've got, we haven't got a garden, but we've got a very, very big terrace at the back of our apartment. And I got a, um, a loads of tubs in and I decided I would make it beautiful. I'd never had time. I'd never, never really taken ownership of my backyard, as it were. And... So much of my focus during lockdown was on flowers and plants. And my wife said to me, how do you know what you're doing? Um, you just seem to be able to do it. And I said, I, said, I thought everybody knew it. And then, and then I thought, no, it's because when I was about nine or 10, my dad loved his garden and I would just follow around behind him all the time. He gave me a little patch of garden. And then after about a couple of years, that would have been the least cool thing to do ever. <laughs> so I, I, I probably broke my dad's heart and just kind of turned my back on it and had no interest in, in, in plants at all. Isn't it lovely that that was still buried in there? You said earlier it was comedy in my DNA. Um, Monty Don was in my DNA, or a Monty Don was in my DNA too, and I didn't realise until I was in my 70s. Oh, well, that's fantastic, isn't it, when something comes back at that level. So, Tony, what makes you laugh? Guilt, embarrassment, nervousness, uh, feeling lesser than other people in the room. If you watch my documentaries, you'll see I laugh an awful lot. They have to cut out an awful lot of my laughter. And that laughter is about passivity. It's about pacifying the room so that I can get what I want out of the room. And on telly, you'll sit an awful lot, I think on chat shows in particular, this, this laughter, which isn't like laughter at the end of a punchline, laughter at the end of a rude joke. It's, <laughs> it's just, the, it's, it's the noise, uh, it's like monkeys, isn't it? It's like yeah. monkeys gibbering in a cage. I think most laughter is monkeys gibbering in a cage. I would go as far as to say that. So you use it as a, a tool to sort of pacify the room or to get rid of your stress? Or how do you use it? Uh, I think everybody does. I don't think it's something uh, that just I do. I uh, Wherever I go, I can hear it all the time from people. When people come up to you, they're, well, maybe they're just laughing at me, but, but when they're not. Um, I think that's what most laughter is. And I think that what comics and comedians are able to do is to corral all that into little bite-sized chunks, which are pleasurable because they're controlled. Well, I, I think that's so true. And the whole Humorology project is, is about the, uh, being able to do that. But what you do is, I, I think you have a superpower, essentially, because as a psychologist, you get to change people's state. And to be able to change somebody's state is a superpower and you can move them to a new place. Now, somebody could be in the depth of depression, but it's hard to be depressed when you're laughing and you come in and you change people and your, your life 
or in essence, has been about changing people's states in a good way. You're absolutely right. It's what we call working an audience, isn't it? When you go on stage, hopefully what will happen is there'll be a round of applause, unless you're in the middle of a checkoff, in which case it's really irritating <laughs> to the other actors. And that has actually happened to me at the Bristol Old Vic. Um, uh, but normally you go on stage, you'll get some sense of uh, a hello back from the audience. And you know that you now have some time to take them with you on whatever journey it is that you want to, to take them on. And it's like, a, it's like the ceiling of a contract between you and the audience. But it's a contract which can be torn up by them at any time. So you've got to kind of keep keep working at it, keep checking the clauses, as it were. Sorry, I'm getting bored with this metaphor, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, no, it's a great metaphor. But it's, I mean, it is, the humour is the ultimate bonding tool, isn't it? Because uh, you've travelled around the world on all these wonderful documentaries. And the art of doing that, I would have thought, is by connecting with people, getting rapport, how do you get rapport with people from different cultures? I mean, is it your face is is your fortune in that sense of of lighting up other people's lives without necessarily being able to speak their language. I can I can only tell you what I do, and I don't know whether it works for other people, and I don't know if it's how other people do it, but I know that for me, it's about letting go, being open, taking risks. Um, not worrying about whether you'll offend somebody, actually. Because if you've got your antennae up, you'll know as soon as you start to offend them and you can pull back. If you have offended them too much, then you can apologise. And um, uh, uh, so just just be who you are. Recognise what the interplay is between you and uh, uh, the other person, honour it, play with it, tease it, go further. And, you know, 99, out of, 99 times out of 100, that does work. But what you've just described, I think the great uh, comics, great comic actors, great uh, actors do, and which something our listeners can take away, is listen, is really listen. And I, when I talk about listening, you know what I mean. You, you look at people's faces and you listen off the top, as we call it in psychology. So you get to the essence of them. Are they, I mean, the simple thing is, are the eyebrows going up, i.e. tell me more? Yeah, um, I, I would take it one step further and say, as a discipline, you ought to listen actively, if that doesn't sound too poncy, you yeah, know, because... We all think we're listening. All those, all that, all the time we're going, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. We think we're listening. We're making those noises. We must be listening. We're not listening. You know, it's a, it's a, it's like being in the moment, isn't it? Most of us are in the, in the moment about four times a day. Three of them when you're having a poo. It, it's the same with listening. It's very, very easy to think what what is it that I'm going to say next, <laughs> rather yeah. than be with the person on their route because actually it takes you a millisecond in reality to think of what you're going to say next it's just like an emotion what you're going to say next in real life you don't rehearse the words you don't fluff when you're having a conversation you don't have to get halfway through and say sorry can we go again on that <laughs> um so you can actually stay with the person for as long as you want, then maybe just as you hear their energy dropping, maybe that's the time to, to come in with your next observation or your next question. But until then, just be with them, I think. I think all the great performers are listening for feedback, whether that's from the other performers. I mean, all the uh, shows you've done, you can tell that you are trusting and listening which I know you went to Central and studied, those trust exercises are very important to life. And just people in normal life, I always say when, when people stand up to make a speech, just do it and give your attention outward. Because if you and I go to the pub and we meet, we're not going to take notes, are we? About and go, did you see the game Saturday, Tony? You know. <laughs> That's a very funny idea. Yeah. <laughs> someone, 
sort of being unsure about how to talk something I haven't met before and getting out the notes and the first one is, did you watch the game on Saturday? <laughs> well, well, but that's the absurdness. And when people are giving speeches or uh, being interviewed uh, on the radio or television, you find that they're, they're, tr they're so much uh, in what we call the conscious brain because, you know, the conscious brain can only hold between five and nine pieces of information and the unconscious can hold millions of pieces of information. When we're having a chat, we're in the unconscious. You're saying something, I'm listening, you're reacting and back. And it's just like a game of tennis at that point. Last week, I did my first live gig for ages because of COVID. And it was a corporate and it was, um, uh, it was a guy who had a big internet type firm and he hadn't seen uh, his juniors, many of them he hadn't seen ever. Um, uh, and so he wanted to get them all together. And what he decided to do was to, he just bought a new big fancy house, lovely house up in Oxfordshire somewhere, a huge garden. And he decided to get them all to dig his garden. And he would get me to come in as a surprise as the person who used to present time team at the end and judge all the trenches. Um, I got, when I got there, he was terribly relaxed about it, but he said, it's all gone completely tits up. He said, they, he said, they couldn't do the digging. When they tried to do the digging, they didn't find anything. At lunchtime, I foolishly offered them alcohol. <laughs> they blundered around all afternoon and we haven't got anything for you to judge. In fact, we haven't even got any archaeological finds for you to talk about. And... Well, there were two things. First of all, and it was very interesting that he was the CEO. First of all, I was able to de deal with that because my client was so relaxed. The whole reason I'd gone there, and he was paying me a decent wage, the whole reason that I was getting that money had completely foundered. He didn't know why. You know, how would he know anything about my experience in the past? But it was like he just trusted me to sort it out. And so... I did, and I just used everything that I had done for the last 60 years. You know, all that vocabulary, performing vocabulary, emotional vocabulary, words vocabulary, just came out, and I was bouncing off all the what all the other people were saying, which is what you were saying before about listening. And I was storming, and the more that I did it, the more adrenaline, nice adrenaline was uh, produced rather than fear adre adrenaline. And like any junkie, I wanted more of it. So I was actually prepared to do more, to take more risks. Uh, and it just, and when I got back home afterwards, my wife said, I haven't seen you this excited for ages. And I said, it was just, because I know, even though those people weren't doing it, I, I know I did a really good job. And part of do doing a really good job for me is people don't see the scaffolding. Yeah. And the experience and everything. But also very interesting is that he was calm, you were calm, and suddenly, and that is experience and that is knowledge. Uh, in psychology, we say if you want anybody to go into any state, you have to go into that state first. So if you're there and the CEO's going, uh, oh my God, what's God? I don't think you're going to go into that state. The audience is going to go to that state. It's all going to go to pot. Tell me a true funny story about something that's happened to you, Tony. What immediately leaps to mind is I used to do a very rude show on Channel 4 called Who Dares Wins. And uh, we took it on tour doing live shows. And that included what was known as the Emperor's New Clothes sketch. It started with Jimmy Mulvin and Rory McGrath on stage as two tailors. And there was the curtain to the dressing room in the middle of the stage. And they were saying, they were shouting into this cubicle, going, oh, it's a very nice suit. And it really won't cost very much um, at all. And you look fantastic in it. And then I opened the uh, curtains and I was naked. And they would tell really pretty rubbish jokes like oh there's a split up the back sir or oh, look at that <laughs> oh, shit, oh, isn't it? look at that dangly bit I'll snip it off um, and uh, I, can't, I can't even remember how, how the sketch ended I think that's I, I, I think we didn't know how to end it so somebody interrupted the sketch anyway we put we took it on tour and the great thing I think for a comedian is 
when you're nude, it, it's like, it's a funny suit. Whatever you look like, it's a funny suit. And any joke like, oh, there's a split up the back, becomes 10 times funnier than a, 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 anything normally would. And again, it's that thing about the more relaxed you are, or appear to be being in the nude, even if you have given yourself a polish for about 20 seconds before you went on stage. You're, you're confident in, in, in that. Even if the material isn't great, there's something about being in the nude. Um, so we... We did it on stage, and at the end, of, at the end of it, I wandered off stage, ran round the interior corridor to the back of the theatre, then came in at the back of the theatre, and started wandering through the audience looking for my clothes. So I was actually squeezing past everybody in their rows and going whoa, and looking under their <laughs> seats, thus sticking my bottom in their faces. Um, Pretty hilarious stuff. And all that worked really well until we went, to, we were playing in a cinema in Lincoln. And I went off stage and there was no intervening cor corridor between the stage and the back of the theatre, although I didn't realise that. And I pushed the fire doors, opened them, they swung shut again, and there was I in the car park, totally naked. <laughs> I went to the, I, I went to the next door, it was also a fire door, and the next, and the next, and the next. <laughs> and, and eventually, uh, I got round to, uh, to the front of the theatre, so I'm now in the main road. And I walked to the theatre, I pushed open the door, and there were two programmes, so there's little girls, you know, well, young women, 16, 15, 16. And they looked up at me, and I said, it's all right, I'm in the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word now that is it's funny isn't it because telling that I, i'm still thinking about it it's funny but actually it is all about terror and insecurity which goes back to what i was saying earlier what makes you laugh yes. yeah and, and... What makes you love someone just about to be arrested for obscenity in the street. Yeah, and the, I, the other two words you used earlier on were guilt and embarrassment makes you laugh as well. So it, it, yeah. that's the perfect story. It encompasses it is, all it? those things. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. You starred in one of the greatest comedies of all time. I, I've always wondered, did you actually know any of the other actors and performers before you started? No, I had always loved what I thought of as Oxbridge comedy. The first one I remember was in the early 60s. It was called That Was The Week That Was. And it had David Frost in it and Ned Sherin, Millicent Martin was in it. Um, Roy Kinnear was in it. Uh, and uh, I just thought it was wonderful. I, I loved, it was dazzling and it was smart. And up until then, however funny comedy had been to me. There was a bit of me that was slightly irritated by it because it seemed so trivial. And if, that, I mean, if that's a snobbish thing to say, that's fair enough. I'm a bit of a comic snob. Um, but I loved that, I loved that comedy. And, but I left school at 16 because I was going to be an actor. And so there was no, you know, the only way to get into that kind of comedy with Monty Python and uh, 40 Towers, not the nine o'clock news, was if you had been in Footlights or Alps or something similar, uh, which I was never going to be able to do. And then purely out of the blue, and it was just because uh, they couldn't cast the part. They, I got the script on the Thursday, and it was for a, a, a pilot programme starting the following Monday for Rowan Atkinson's new series. So it was obviously desperation on their part. I learned later I was the eighth choice. Everybody had turned it down because it was a rubbish part. It's only about, about eight lines and none of them were funny. Uh, but from the moment I went into rehearsals with them, it was like I was with them, my, my soul brothers. It was so, I still remember those early rehearsals really vividly, more than most things in my working life, just because you were so, there was this thing that I had learned to do, and part of it I had always known how to do since I was two. Part of it I picked up on work. It was this thing, it was my thing. And it was, in a sense, it was a very private thing, in a sense, quite a lonely thing. And suddenly I'm in a room full of people who not, can not only do the thing, they could do it better than you, but not in a, a competitive way, or at least I thought not at the time. It turned out it was pretty competitive, but, but it was wonderful. It was so stimulating. And then at the end of the week, 
the head of comedy came in and said, um, sorry, there's going to be industrial action at BBC all next week and we can't tape it. And Lord knows when we'll be able to because all the studios are booked up. Mm. And so I had to walk away from it. And even when we got a remount of the pilot, I couldn't do it because I was working at the National Theatre at that time. What happened was John Lloyd, the, the brilliant producer of it all, he rang me up and said, Tony, I've got some news from you. They've... Uh, BBC have given us the series. And I said, well, that's great. I'm so pleased for you. And do tell Ryan I'm really pleased for him too. And he said, he said yeah, well, pleased for you as well. And I said, why? He said, well, we want you to be Baldrick. And I, I said, well, but you made the pilot already. And I wasn't in it. He said, don't you remember, I told you when you said you couldn't be in the pilot, that if we ever got a series, that we would want you to be Baldrick. Mm. And I thought, I, he had told me that, but I thought it was just the kind of old bollocks that producers always say to people when they're giving them the, the shoe off. So I'd never taken it seriously. And for him, it was perfectly serious. Oh, I love that story. And I'm intrigued because they, they, they all seemed like very Oxbridge, as you mentioned, uh, who seemed to know each other and they seemed like a set. Uh, the show was very class based comedy and, and you were pretty much the only working class character. Do you think humour is a great leveller in bringing people together? I've talked to Stephen Fry about how it works on the audience, which Maybe it's not what your question meant, but I, I just think it's quite interesting. Mm. And what he said was, the thing about what we all do is it's all a bit clever, clever, clever. And people listen to that and they are dazzled by it for a bit. But after a while, it's a bit, oh, God, blimey. It's a bit, you know, I'm just watching the television. I'm not studying for a degree in metallurgy or something. Um, but then as soon as Baldrick comes on, they're safe. Apart from one, apart from a lot of things, A, he listens a lot, going back to what you were saying earlier. Uh, he's also very slow. He also pauses a lot. And what he says is very simple. And you can be with him. And in fact, you can, as an audience, as it were, almost climb inside him and negotiate the whole programme, as it were, through his face and his footprint. And I just thought that was a really interesting observation. You, you've written a lot yourself, and obviously, the, the, as I mentioned in the introduction, the Semmel Maid Marian, um, which you wrote and uh, starred in and directed and did everything. And I think, is it important, and this is something for our listeners, to be able to get a good uh, atmosphere on set or in a company in order to get the best out of everyone? The advantage of making television as distinct from making real life is that there is an editor who can take out all the cock-ups, all the embarrassments, all the little squabbles. So I would say it isn't absolutely necessary to have a good atmosphere. And I've been on sets where there is a terrible atmosphere, but you would never know it from the edit. But as far as, certainly I think as far as the floor is concerned, i.e. the camera people and the set designers and, and all that, who are servicing those irritating, narcissistic little birds who are doing the performing, I, I think, yes, in that case, I think it's vital that you all have a good relationship with each other. Otherwise, how are you going to manage the twats who say the words? Well, well, that's true. And, and uh, you do so many shows around the world. In fact, you've got a new uh, show coming out on Channel 4, Britain's Forgotten Wars. Um, mm. can, can you tell us, A, a little bit about the show and B, uh, how it was made and what the atmosphere was like on set? i tell you why we made it, and it, I'm, I'm glad you asked me that question, because this is a series I really care about. It's a series that I pitched, it was my idea. And when you're a performer, you actually, very seldom does a show that you have pitched get made. By and large, it's, they're made because the television station wants it, or because an independent company wants it. There are other kind of reasons, or the people who are, schedulers as they're called the people who work out what kind of thing they wanted at a particular time um 
but I was lucky enough. And I think one of the great things, one of the great thanks I've got for Paul Drake, it, 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 from Paul, I think, uh, but I was lucky in that respect. And I think one of the great gifts, the boons that I've received from Baldrick is that he's opened the office door for me, if you know what I mean, that I can go in and pitch things now and people will at least listen to them. And I wanted to do something about the wars that Britain had fought between the end of the Second World War and the beginning of the Falklands. And I've played this game with loads of people asking them what, what they were. And people just don't know, an awful lot of them, they don't know if you say Malaya to most people or, or Kenya, Kenya to, to most people, I have a clue that we were ever there. And um, given that we were in uh, Malaya for around about 150 years now, British Army was, was fairly active quite a lot of that time. It's really sad. The Malayans don't remember either. I, when I was out filming in Malaya, they said, to be quite honest, our history didn't, didn't start until we got rid of you guys and we had our own government. That was when history starts and that's where, what we're taught. So there's all, all that labour, all that British taxpayers' money, all that sacrifice of life for all those years. And then a few years later, everyone's gone into to permanent amnesia. And, and I wanted to do that because I was thinking about the Gulf War, the Iraq War, um, particularly Afghanistan. And of course, this was before we actually left. And I was thinking, we fought the Afghan people twice before in the 19th century, and it ended really badly both times. The Russians had fought them and it was a disaster. The Americans had fought them and it was a disaster. Didn't anybody in the Foreign Office or the Cabinet ever study any kind of history? And I thought to myself, I think it would be a real boon to people if I could just tell them about all those wars that our forces were engaged in, apart from anything else, the sacrifice our, our people made was huge. And I, we talked to a lot of, uh, uh, particularly ex-army people, some of them in their 90s now, because we, we went as far back as, as Suez and Korea. And almost all of them are pretty hacked off that nobody remembers what they did. And often I think we tend to think of Officers as complete goons, and I'm blamed Blackadder for that, and, <laughs> uh, and uh, the ordinary soldier is stupid. Actually, when you, when you talk to these people, particularly about the fighting that they were engaged in, they have a kind of maturity and a kind of wisdom that puts the rest of us in the shade. And it goes back to what we were talking about, about, about the now and listening and working as a team. I think, you know, when you've been fighting with people for a long time, you get, you really get to value that kind, that way of living, that way of working, that way of operating. I'm, I'm interested, you said that, you know, their maturity, their wisdom, was there also um, a sense of humour that got them through? Always, always, always. Uh, uh, one of the things about uh, humour, which we nearly touched on, but not quite, is about, de-escalating the situation isn't it I, I've, I've got another series I've got two series on the same time which is mad I haven't had anything on the telly for about five months but um, I've got two on I've also got another two series on the shelf so you're going to see a lot of them fairly soon but um, yeah I'm, I'm making a uh, I've been making a series after series about the Thames which has always fascinated me great shot on it Shot one about the shot a series about the Thames at night so I'm going into uh, oil refineries uh, the docks servicing of the ferries, uh, all the, the big jobs, the managing of the water that people do through the night that we don't know anything about. It's, it's like listening to a comedy show all the time, all the people around. It's all... Yeah, just pass me that. The whole night. And it's not because they're psychotic. It's not because they're unlike any anybody else is that they can create an atmosphere where they can in best at best enjoy what they do and at worst bear what they do yeah so would you agree with me that humor aids resilience especially in in very very stressful situations oh enormously yeah yeah i think i think it's uh, it's probably the best tactic that we can 
ever use uh, other than getting the job right. <laughs> well, yeah, and it goes back to you've got to laugh, haven't you? Because yeah. uh, it, 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 it's our only weapon, especially when, when there's mayhem going on around you. Well, what do you think the world would be like without humour? I think it's one of those unponderable questions because I don't think the world, I don't think our world, or at least our perception of the world, would exist. Because humour is as much part of who we are as, uh, as breathing and walking and seeing and being in the joke. It, it's... It's the fizz in our lives. There was a, a, a fantastic presenter director who you remember, uh, uh, who was also a comic, uh, uh, lots of younger people won't, called Dr. Jonathan Miller. Oh, uh, and he spent the first third of his life, as it were, living in humour. He moved away from it because there were things that interested him more, but he was, I found him very interesting to talk to about it. He said, he said humour is a fizz. And it's a fizz, which is, it's like the bubbles of oxygen in, in, in your body. He said, timing, what's timing? He said, I don't know, but my bet is it's something to do with the rhythms in our body. Why would we all get timing the same? Why would we all fall about or kind of go ole when somebody does a superb bit of timing, unless it was something that was deeply shared within all of us? Well, I'm I'm fascinated by what you say uh, um, about timing and everything. You have a, a a real artistry in your comedy timing. Do you think comedy can be learnt, or is it purely instinctive? I think that's like saying, "Do you think dreaming can be learned?" Um, and uh, Jung would have Jung would have probably have said. Well, actually, in a way, yes, we have all got that capability and we all do it unconsciously. And what he said was, try that exercise of as soon as you wake up, writing down your dream. And it doesn't matter if you can't quite remember it and you put in something and you're not sure whether you're making it up right now or it's part of the dream, because that is part of it anyway. And he said, after a while, when you write your dreams down, your dreams get more vivid, they get more clear, you can understand them more. So I don't think it's a question of, can I learn to be funny? But I think it's that you can learn strategies to be more funny. Yes, I, I think that's, but I, do you, uh, my analogy is always, um, I think I can learn to be a better footballer but I, I think some people are born with with great skills for, you know, a David Beckham or something, whereby their hand, or their foot eye coordination is at a level superior to mine to start with. So I can get a lot better and I can perhaps be Gary Neville. Um, but to get to the heights that you have reached, I think takes some kind of inherent um Comedy timing, uh, understanding, intrinsic understanding. So, you know. Uh, my, my bet, I, I don't know if this is true, but this, this is what I feel. I just I kind of offer it up to you, is that when we say some people can be better than other people, by and large, it's because they have physical attributes which will, which will give them a superior skill. It may be that they have better mental attributes, but we don't know enough about the mind to know whether or not we all have an infinite number of, well, we know we have an infinite number of possibilities. We don't know whether we can access them or not. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe as, as um, uh, a great thinker's name totally escapes. As, as Aldous Huxley said, maybe actually the skill is learning how to shut off so much so we're not getting too much information at a time and we can just concentrate on the one thing. Maybe that's one of the things that makes us great. The idea that it's genetic seems to me well, at best unproven, but I certainly know that my granddad was, was he you know, I'm a from a Cockney family, and he was very ba-doo-ba-doo-ba-doo-ba-doo-ba-doo. My dad was very ba-doo-ba-doo-ba-doo. I am. 
when my son is on the phone, people often confuse him with me. I suspect because of his rhythms, his attitudes towards the world, that kind of thing. He is totally different from me. He's a six footer, he's blonde. You know, he looks very much as though he comes from the other side of the family. But either there was part of a, a, a comedy sperm <laughs> <laughs> when his mum from me. Um, or I think more likely that uh, it's just that environment that, uh, that he's been part of. So we're doing the nature versus nurture argument here, a, a thing, and, and I, oh, I you noticed. I, no, well, yeah, and uh, oh, this has gone very highbrow, Tony. We've had Jung, we've had nature versus <laughs> nurture. It's marvelous. All comedians who I've grown up with and know, they kind of they heard the funny quite early on. And when I was talking to you about being young, one of the first things you said to me was that that uh, I was keen to do a joke. Now, that may be the reward of getting the laugh, getting the love, whatever that is, but you heard the joke and you could do it. There are some people who don't hear the joke, first of all, know where the funny is. It's interesting because I was listening to you then and I heard you say you heard the joke. And I, I took that in, checked it around myself, and I thought, no, I see the joke. And I think that's... I think that's what I do, and I don't quite I don't quite know what it means. Although immediately you said it, my dad got two service medals, which he which like those service medals he got a couple of years after the war, and I said, oh, what are they for? And he said, um, well, one of them was because the Nathy made really horrible sausages, and no one would eat them, which would have been a terrible waste of money, and I was the uh, I was the only person who was brave enough to eat the disgusting sausages. And I, you know, I, I, when I tell you that, Jonah, I've still got the same movie running that I had when he told it to me. Well, that's very interesting from a psychological perspective because um, we all lead with certain things. Some people are visual, which uh, some people are auditory. Now, we all have them all, but your, your probably sequence probably goes uh, visual, auditory, then kinesthetic. And so you see the joke being funny, whereas I've always heard it. I've always heard the rhythm of it and everything. But I love the fact that you, you actually see it and you can, uh, you can visualise the way it's going. That's brilliant. Um, if I asked you to write a business case, and I know you are not somebody who writes a business case, but we have to convince businesses yeah. that humour is important, what would you include in the business case? Certainly pacification. I think it's very easy in any work situation for the tension to rise. Before we started to do this, do you remember, I was really struggling, before we turned this tape on, I was really struggling and I got slightly tetchy with your engineer because he was asking me to do things that I'd, I'd already tried. And immediately, and, and as soon as I'd done it, I thought, oh my God, that's really a complete prat to me. Um, but immediately you came in and you went, and I knew what you were doing, but it, 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 it worked anyway. And, and I, I do think a lot of us have the tendency particularly those of us for whom work matters, to get wound up very easily. And we actually know that the more we get wound up, the less well we function. Well, we know it afterwards, but we don't know it at the time. And humour is just wonderful for that, for, for pricking those little pomposities and anxieties and neuroses. So I would certainly say that's important. I would say bo for bo bonding, it's very important as well. One of the reasons that Cockneys have always been perceived as having a, a Cockney wit, a very rhythmical Cockney wit, is because it's such a big river that there was more industry and more working class activity going on around London than anywhere else. And just to get through all that stuff, you had to do a bit of the, hey, but I can't bring it down there all the time. It was just, it was part of the function I think and I think any boss who doesn't get that doesn't really understand why people talk in the way that they they do I, I love that pacification and bonding I think that is so smart and uh, any uh, financial directors out there would do well to listen to that as well as CEOs um, we've reached a part of the show Tony 
which we like to call quick fire questions. Quick fire questions. Who's the funniest business person that you've met? The funniest in the sense that he does comedy best is John Lloyd, who was the producer of Black Adder and Spitting Image and QI. But he's also one of the most serious people that I've ever met. He's also one of the most utopian people um, and one of the most polite people. What book makes you laugh? When I was about seven, there was a book called... um, Half Magic by a man called Edward Eager. And it was about these kids who picked up this old coin and if ever they wished for something, they got half of it, which is a great situation comedy moment. I didn't learn until years later that originally he had been an actor, but it's about these kids having these adventures. And I thought it was absolutely wonderful. Half Magic, fantastic. What film makes you laugh? Films, by and large, don't make me laugh. I used to love Buster Keaton. I found him funnier than Chaplin. Chaplin, I always found achingly sad, and I didn't know why, and now I know why. It was because he, he, there was so much of him that was achingly sad. Buster Keaton, I I always used to find very funny. Uh, Laurel and Hardy, I used to find very funny. Oh, I, I don't really like American comedy, by and large. It's too shouty for me. Mm. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, oh, Ghostbusters I loved. Maybe, uh, it doesn't cool. seem so shouty, maybe it was. But uh, no, uh, telly is my home for comedy. No, oh, great. Um, we're going to take a shift to the other side to look at the other way. Is What is not funny, Tony? Nothing. It's like what is not interesting, nothing. There are boring ways of talking about things. And my job is often to find out what's interesting. There are deeply unfunny things about everything, but there are also funny things. So I don't think, I don't think there's anything that's in inverted commas out of bounds. Uh, there's, 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 there's sensibility, there's understanding, there's all those things with, with being a common thread through throughout what we've been talking about but I don't think I don't think anything's not funny so is it all about your intention when you're uh, you're saying it if your intention is to 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 punch down does that make it less funny as it your intention is to hurt or wound or bully is that is there anything that you particularly don't go to because it makes you feel uncomfortable no, I'm always seduced by the idea of going into the unmentionable for, for comedy. I, I love that. The person I find most interesting about that is Frankie Boyle, uh, who, who I th- in many ways, I think he's the Lenny Bruce of, 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 of our times, uh, in that he is, he's clearly, I've never met him, but he, he seems to be clearly a very passionate man, a man who tries to have an enormous amount of integrity and a man who's got this thing called humor that he can use to negotiate and discuss these things and it he feels it's, it's like he's a knight in armor he's on a bound to take risks all the time and sometimes they're awful and sometimes they, they offend people deeply but and and i can see in his eyes when he's been talking about it, about it there's this brash guy will say anything who's deeply hurt by the fact that uh, that that people have been upset by things he said. I I don't like it when he slags off other comedians. I think you I think you ought to respect people who work in the same industry as you do. Know? To me, that is a given, just because it's such hard work, just because all of us put in the hours and the risks and the danger, even if we don't do comedy like the stuff that you like, it's still, you know, we're still in the same army as it were. But I don't... I, I do have an enormous amount of respect for him, even when I get really cross with him. No, I, 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 I completely agree. I think Frankie's a, a, a one-off and, and, and so, so intelligent. But isn't the thing about comedy is that you don't know if you've crossed the line until you go over it. And so he, he, he's constantly having to push that line because we, you really don't know where it is. 
I think that's not quite the, the right metaphor. I think it's more, you know, we're in, you know when you're in the danger zone, but you don't know that, that you've trodden on the mine until you have. <laughs> <laughs> I've, often, I've, I've often said things which I've, I, I've thought, Ooh, oh, you know, should I really be saying this? Well, yes, because it's so scary. It makes me fizz. If I've got this fizz, then other people will share it with me. Um, and, you know, on a good night, 90% of the time, people will share it with you, but there's always going to be some people and sometimes when you do tread on that mind. And I don't think you can prejudge that because I think it's a, it, that's a subjective thing on the part of the person who's receiving it. What word makes you laugh, Tony? Smorgasbord. I don't, is that, have I say it right? Um, I, I, I like it because the O has got a slice through it, and I always think of the knife that cuts up the things on the board. <laughs> never realised until this moment in time that I thought that. Um, I like it because it's so unlike anything that, that I would have had at home when I was a little lad. And I like it because my wife hates the word. She goes, ah, I don't see that word. <laughs> there are, there is one or two words, isn't there, that, for most people that they want to go, ah, don't say that word. Lord knows why, but uh, no, that, that's my word. I want, I just want that one word on my tombstone. Oh no, I, I won't, because my wife won't come and visit me, but uh, on the back. <laughs> yeah, he had a smorgasbord of a life. Yes, he did. No, no, He's, no. It stunk of pickled herring. <laughs> <laughs> what sound makes you laugh? Well, the fart, of course. <laughs> has, has anybody that you've asked that question not said the fart? Well, a couple of people, but the farts have come up quite a lot, <laughs> to be honest with you, in more See, even, even that sentence is funny. <laughs> exactly. Just to say, sound is very, very important in comedy. Uh, going back to John Lloyd, Lloyd again, he was very scrupulous about the sounds that everything made. And particularly, people think that Rowan was constantly beating me up in that series. If you look at it closely, he's such a pussycat, Rowan. He was always at least that much away from me because he was frightened of hurting me. He wasn't like John Cleese, he used to batter uh, uh, Andrew Sachs. Uh, but what John did was he just got exactly the right noise for each hit that made it seem like it was agony. And, uh, and ch extraneous chicken noises, those kinds of things, they're, they're wonderful. They're, they're, they're always, I think, part of the television comedy vocabulary. Yeah, comedy gold. A, a yeah. funny sound can take you to new places. Would you rather be considered clever or funny? Well, you've got to say funny, haven't you? Anyone who thinks they would rather be clever is a tosser. <laughs> I'm In with one. you all the way, Tony. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to be a tosser. Be funny. <laughs> yeah. And finally, Tony, desert island gags. You can only take one joke with you to a desert island. What is it? To have only one joke constantly repeated for the rest of my life would be an absolute torture for me. It would stop being funny around about the 14th time, if it was a really good joke. By the 50th, it would be worse than being in a prisoner of war camp. So I will choose, Sue, uh, a comfy <laughs> mattress and one of those pillows that, you know, you can rest your head in really nicely. Thank you. So you can come up with your own jokes in the comfort of your own bed. <laughs> Different one every time, and not just jokes, mate. <laughs> Tony Robinson, thank you so much for A, not standing on any minds during this chat, and B, for being absolutely warm, witty, and hilarious. Thank you. Lovely talking to you. Bye. The Humorology Podcast was hosted by Paul Barros and produced by Simon Banks. Music by Steve Hayworth, creative direction by Les Hughes, and additional research by Helen Sykes. Please remember to subscribe, like, and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Big Sky production.